After the tremendous success of my first video, obviously I had to make another one. Another one! Since talking with a growling voice about some unpopular game that time has forgotten isn't really the way to make it in this YouTube thing. Perhaps talking about some obscure book that time didn't even remember in the first place is the way to go. But 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 don't, don't click away yet. This is also a Dark Souls playthrough to win a bet video. In vain hopes to stop me from deluding myself into being a YouTuber, my dear friend, let's call him uh, Pedro for the purpose of this video, said I shall bet the 10 European shekels that thou canst not reach Anor Londo without perishing fever than 10 times. Now I know what you're thinking, like, pfft, that's easy bro, but for you maybe, the catch here is that the last time I played Dark Souls was exactly 11 years ago. And I don't remember enough to play the game properly. I do know that I'll need the master key to access Blighton earlier than intended, so we'll go with that. Now, I'm not petty. I would never waste possibly 10 hours of my life just to win 10 euros. That's what my daily job is for. So it's not about the money, it's about uh, the honor. So we are doing this for honor. <laughs> Wait, since he didn't specify the class, we will use the RNG to decide it for me. Obviously, I'm not gonna go the easy route and pick magic like some pleb. Okay, RNG will spin. Boring! Okay, go ahead, Pewds. Wait, wait! Hold it! Since we don't want me to just farm and get overleveled, we are also adding a time limit so that the challenge has to be done in less than 4 hours. So, ringing 2 bells, getting through Sen's fortress, all that without dying 10 times, and I'm rich in India. Now do it for real perks. Book review. Before we can answer the question that was in the title of this video, we need to address the bigger question, which is obviously, what is the Nightland? A long time ago, way back in history, a long time ago, there was an English author and a sailor called William Hope Hodgson. 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 There's a whole backstory on how he had 9 brothers and sisters, ran away from boarding school to be a sailor at the age of 13, got rejected at first, uh, blah 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 blah. Eventually, this led to him having a 7 year career at the Merchant Navy. During his time at the sea, he took on an interest in photography and started writing because what else are you gonna do while being stuck on a boat for so long? Even literal pirates wrote literal works. Why am I boring you with this? Well, A, cause it's not boring, and B, because it ties into the novel obviously. Allow me to elaborate on both A and B. William Hope Hulkerson was the biggest, not the tallest, but the biggest Chad that ever wrote literature. He was a shorter guy, only 5.6 and had a gentle face, so he was bullied a lot by his seamates, especially since he became a sailor very young. Let's google how much is 5.6 in non-meme measures. Hey, caramba. Now these days, when your mates bully you, you shoot up a school like some degenerate wimp, but William back then committed himself to strict training regimes and a diet, and ironically went all Steve Rogers but without steroids, well at least with his muscles. He was still a manlet, but apparently ended up being a fiercely powerful one. Some historians even went so far to unironically call William the strongest man pound for pound in the whole of England. Sherman. Some illiterate brain dead peasants that are sailing with me are making fun of me and harassing me. Instead of crying and wallowing in my self absorbed pity, I will instead become the strongest man alive and beat everyone who dare to dare. That's just amazing and almost unbelievable. Not only was he the sailor Popeye pulverizing whoever came in his way, he also at one point jumped in the shark infested sea to save a mate and was rewarded for it. He pumped up so much that he started writing about physical culture and since this wasn't popular back then, he moved on to science fiction. 
When the First World War came, he enlisted to join the fight and in 1916 he suffered a broken jaw and a serious head injury, resulting in a mandatory discharge. Having the belief that he would respawn if he died and that life is a video game, he re-enlisted when he sufficiently recovered, only to receive the promotion and sadly die in 1980, apparently while leading a group of people to safety. He wrote a couple of short stories, but his two most notable works are The House on the Borderland and The Nightland. So finally, what is this fucking book about? The Nightland is a book set in a very distant post-apocalyptic future where the sun has died out completely, leaving our world desolate and engulfed in complete darkness. During the time when the book was written, people didn't have the understanding that the sun's power source is nuclear fusion so it was believed that the sun will die in just a few million years. So our Chad Will took this as a concept and set the story of the Nightland in a world that would remain after the eternal darkness envelops us. After the sun died out, uh, catastrophic changes occurred to our world. Humanity survives in a massive pyramid-like structure that's more than 7 miles tall called the Last Redoubt, which is powered and protected by a supernatural force known as the Earth Current. Since this supernatural force only occupies a small portion of space, people build upward. Earth current is also what powers the air cog, a technological or mystical shield that protects the last readout. Since this was written in 1912, some people are arguing that this is effectively the first use of the force field in the history of fiction. Here is where it gets interesting. The pyramid is basically all the time under siege by many unholy, unspeakable and barely describable beings and otherworldly powers. Abhumans, undeads, ghosts, deities from other dimensions, eldritch abomination that can invade the mind if you just try to think about them. And many, 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 many more. It suffice to say that people don't really venture out of the redoubt uh, under any circumstances. What makes matters worse is that humans are aware that Earth Current's force is weakening, and it's only a matter of time before it dies out entirely. Once that happens, the shield protecting them will fall, thus ending humanity once and for all. The technology of this future world is very advanced, but circumstances are such that it's still useless against the evil outside. Reading the Nightland in modern times ironically feels quite refreshing because it's a really old-fashioned if not religious take on good versus evil and what makes us humans. It explores metaphysical concepts and themes of good and evil as tangible entities where humans possess a soul that emits warmth, light and hope, and everything else wants to extinguish that. Imagine if the sun were our god and the earth was its daughter and the mother to us humans. Then the god died and the earth is slowly withering away, dying inevitably. When a part of you dies, necrosis occurs, which is essentially death, the corruption of everything healthy around it, spreading until it kills everything living. When our god died, corruption and death spread, not just from our world. But in this world, some remaining forces of good can be found and maybe even Judeo-Christian god, so I'm not gonna spoil it. It can even be argued that the cosmic beings were the reason why the sun died in the first place, or maybe we even brought it upon ourselves. It's sorta like Kingdom Hearts, but not retarded and not nearly as incomprehensible. But all of that doesn't really matter, because at its core the Nightland is a love story. Yeah. The book actually opens up with the framing of the 17th century where a not named protagonist and the narrator mourns the loss of his beloved wife Mirdat who tragically passed away while giving birth. Consumed by grief and burdened by perpetual sorrow, he then dreams of the long-distance future of the Nightland where their reincarnated souls may unite. Or does he? In that far distant dreamlike future, the reincarnation of our narrator is living in the mentioned last redoubt. He is an apprentice of a scholar and the jack of all trades, well versed in a bit of everything and blessed with high physical powers and strength. However, his mind is plagued by visions and dreams of a world illuminated by a glowing ball in the sky, providing life and warmth. The horrible life-giving sun! The endless blue of enormous portions of water. Basically life in color. Sadly, he is also troubled by the remembrance of his soulmate Murdit dying. You can fill in the blanks yourself. These visions are obviously making him upset and forcing him to question his sanity. 
It's been so long that the history itself forgot that the sun ever existed. Another thing, it is explained that humans have evolved to become beings who are taller and physically stronger than we are now. Our main protagonist happens to be stronger than the most though, like bodybuilder strong. He's also a mathematician, very cunning and a master at wielding the disc-based melee weapon that people from the Nightland are using to defend themselves. In fact, the more you read, the more you realize that the character is in fact the self-insert for our author. Just way dollar. This is jarring, usually, but not when you are the real-life Kazuma Kiryu. Writers write what they know, so when this guy, a dude that jump into the shark-infested waters, create a character that's capable and physically strong, it's believable and badass. On the other hand, when this guy writes about sex, it's... it's... Uh, yeah. When our guy Will writes about his character fighting against a horde than him, uh, you believe it. When he describes receiving or inflicting physical pain, you feel it. It's also justified because this world is so dangerous and deadly that nothing short of a superhuman ace would actually have a chance of surviving even 5 minutes in it on foot. The protagonist is not without faults, but, but he is the 20th century archetype of a hero, coming from a guy who literally died in a war fighting for what he thought was right. The story picks up when, through some magic telephoning, uh, like telepathic communication, the inhabitants of the last readout learn about the existence of another smaller stronghold that they dubbed the Lesser Redoubt. What's also alarming is that the earth current force that powers the Lesser Redoubt is nearly depleted, which means no force field shield, which means no humans pretty soon. The one that made the magic telephoning from the Les Ridao just happens to be the reincarnation of our hero's lost love Mirdat, a girl named Nani. Nani. Just like uh, the narrator, she is also troubled by the exact same dreams and memories of their distant past selves. Learning of the existence of other human beings in this wretched world, being on the brink of extinction, made many younger people and adventurers to basically disobey the elders and form armed legions and venture out trying to reach the lesser readout. To keep spoilers to the minimum, they failed. Soon after, the magical communication abruptly ceased, with the last message indicating that the lesser readout had fallen. Since our hero is a love shark fool, he takes matters into his own hands and decides to go looking for the lesser readout by himself, on foot, without a map, with limited rations and a melee weapon. With only one objective, to find his reincarnated love and bring her back to safety. I think you now understand the reason why I wanted to talk about this book, because this is video games as fuck. You can't have a better premise for a video game than this. The rest of the book details his adventures, trials and tribulations, and to say that they are suspenseful, breathtaking and heartbreaking is an understatement. It also depicts this world, its inhabitants and its technology in incredible detail. I want you to read it so I can tell you more. What I can tell you is that it gave me the most atmospheric video game like feeling I have ever experienced. Rivaling the best games I ever played and I can't name any on top of my head at the moment. And that's it. Sounds like a simple premise, so you might ask, okay, but where are the movies? How come I never heard about this before? Where are the games based on this or set in a similar world? If it's so good, where are the ripoffs? Nowadays, everyone is pretending to be inspired by HP Lovecraft. Every other indie game developer thinks that putting Lovecraftian in their tags would draw in players, but even our favorite racist himself, he was astounded by the Nightlands, so again, what's the problem? Well, you see, this book, uh, this novel, The Nightland, is impossible to read by an ordinary human being or an avid reader. Yes, you heard me right. For some reason, the guy was trying to be clever, so he wrote it in, in archaic English. Think 17th century archaic, but with prolonged, overly long sentences with peculiar rhythmic cadences and prose. There's an insane amount of repetitive phrases and structures that are really hard to digest, which is what turned down many readers 100 years ago and made book incomprehensible to anyone other than people with insane amount of patience. It gets even funnier when you read that some scholars who are slightly more versed in the topic than me 
said that it's not even the real 17th century archaic English and people were quick to criticize this aspect even after the book was released. It's comically butchered archaic English but ironically it's rarely fun navigating through it. If you don't believe me, try playing a drinking game and take a shot every time the sentence starts with and or there. You would die before the 10th page of this overly long book. Again, he made his book an otherworldly experience and that is commendable, but ain't nobody got time for that. Even deciphered, the book is so huge and filled with metaphysical concepts that can't be put to film in any shape or form, so congratulations William Mr. Hope Horson. You might be actually the only good writer in the history of civilization who successfully gatekept his work from Vic Wild Man and the Hollywood. Trying to read this as an ESL is like trying to fly F-16 after learning how to drive a car. Thankfully, an author named James Studart stood up to this task and quote-unquote remastered it in the Nightland A Story Retold, which is what I recommend you read first, if I made you curious enough and you are still watching this wretched video. In fact, if you are still with me, leave a like and comment and subscribe so we can spite Pedro even more. Anyway, Mr. James changed some things, gave the main character a name and added dialogues, while the original book had none. I don't have issues with this cause the original still exists as well and he made sure to point out his changes. Also, can you imagine reading a novel sizable as Dune but without the dialogue? This is not just some wannabe hack or a fan taking someone else's work to put his stamp on it. I legitimately think that the author of the Nightland A Story Retold did this out of the tremendous appreciation for the original work. James Studart essentially made this story more digestible. Now, if you are a purist, nothing stops you from trying out the originals since it's in the public domain and audiobooks are available for free on YouTube. However, I recommend starting with the remastered version. Yeah, it's a bit lame, but a story retold will likely make you curious enough to check out the original and allow you to appreciate it even more. While if you decide to start with the original, it's quite possible for you to lose your patience. Seriously, the book was so hard to read that some idiots thought it's a prophetic work from another plane of existence. You can compare this with the archaic design of the original Resident Evil and how the remake improves it in almost every way. After you get used to the original Resident Evil, it's completely playable, but it still asks for a lot of patience and it was a product of its time. To summarize, the original and unique atmosphere never seen before and since. Breathtaking moments, scenes, creatures, world, etc. Themes of love, self-sacrifice, hopelessness, tragedy, death, persistence, inevitable doom, with some of the most imaginative and vibrant universe ever depicted in the world of fiction. It's also dark, very dark. The author uses half of the book to paint the bleakest setting ever depicted. You think Dark Souls world and atmosphere are hopeless and oppressive? It has nothing on the Nightland. And that's even before our hero steps out of the last readout. With his pre-established religious concepts, Horson made it believable that there are fates way worse than death. It's bleak and disturbing so much that people of this world are each carrying a suicide death pill. Fear of blood creates a fear for the flesh, but what about the fear of death itself which instills a fear for the soul? It truly is a video game like world where every single thing is trying to kill you and more than capable of doing it and your character has to survive because his urge to reunite with his lost love is bigger and more important than the danger and everything else. Like I said, at its core it's a love story, because what else can contrast the absolute horror of everything I described and half of what I deliberately didn't mention other than love. This is why the Nightland story works so much. It's the oldest story of them all, a hero trying to save a girl, but it takes a hopelessly romantic person to frame the story in this manner. It's like he said, hmm, how dire do the odds need to be against my hero in order for me to illustrate that the love is the most powerful force of good that exists? If it were just some self-insert dude I'm strong and I can fend off against worst possible shit you can imagine, now that would be cringe. What makes his story endearing is the fact that he is driven by a seemingly lost concept of love and selflessness. Then it's over, and you realize there's truly 100% nothing like it. Nothing. 
not a single game that could fill that void. Sure, you will recognize these concepts and creatures in a lot of different works, but it's like the Nightline somehow has all of them in one place. I didn't read every science fiction work, far from it, so who knows, I will continue my search and feel free to recommend one in the comments. But I read the Nightland and it's beautiful. This concludes my first in the series of books that I would like to cover that would appeal to gamers looking for the sense of scale, adventure and the overall atmosphere that rivals, if not surpasses, the best that video games have to offer. So now, knowing all of that, let's turn to the topic of this video and give an answer. In what way did the Nightland influence the Dark Souls series? The answer is... it didn't. And I want the best.